Welcome to the Determined People podcast, spreading encouragement, hope, and strength around the world. Today, we launch our new format video. Our guest today, he retired from a long, esteemed career in public policy at the end of 2019. Mark Lehman is a best-selling author, and today his first book is what we're going to talk about. It's called The Shoebox Chronicles. We're going to learn about the book, the inspiration behind it, and also He's going to share with you some stories of some of the most colorful characters that you've ever heard of. So welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks. Uh, glad to be here. Where did the title of the book come from, The Shoebox Chronicles? Well, it was very interesting. Um, the uh, I was dismantling my parents' house in 19, uh, I'm sorry, 2017. Uh, it uh, was in the hills west of Austin, a uh, home they'd lived in um, for 60 years, and they had both passed away. And the very last thing I found was a shoebox full of old, old letters, and I came within a hair of throwing those away, but I set them aside. Uh, as all the furniture and everything was removed from the house uh, uh, the day before the closing when we sold the house, and also the day before they tore the house down. And um, when I started looking through that shoebox that night, I realized uh, that was the story of my life. Uh, the first letter was dated at uh, 19, um, 1891, and um, went up to almost present, and uh, I um, realized that um, I was just a part of a long continuum, and my family history, like every family history, uh, is really profound and very important, and uh, the um, chronicles of my life were in that shoebox. Sure. So you found the shoebox as you're tearing out your, your parents' home, the home you grew up in. Had your mo mother or father never told you about these letters? Not necessarily those, but they left them behind because they downsized and cleaned out. Uh, so it was obvious they left those letters there as something that they hoped I would find and hoped I might find use for, my brother find use for. Uh, they did have a few letters which I have incorporated into the shoebox which she did want me to find. Uh, the very first letter she and my father wrote back and forth to each other right after they were married um, and through their life. Uh, maybe each of them had five or six letters uh, that uh, that they did leave behind, and, and I knew about those, but I did not know about the shoebox. And I think it was just as I found, uh, when somebody writes something down, when something is handwritten, whether it's just a note, a card, a letter, a diary, an inscription in a book, whatever, it's really hard to throw away. And I have a feeling my mom just did not know what to do with those letters, which she had saved all her life because she didn't want to throw them away. And uh, I'm glad I found them. They, they certainly painted a very rich history for me. You bet. And one thing you mentioned, which is in the book, was like a love letter between, you know, love letters between your mom and your dad. And we, you know, we rarely get to glimpse into our parents and them being, you know, like young in love couples and talking about their goals, dreams, desires for their, for their life together and their family. But you got a glimpse into that. Oh, that was amazing to me because my parents were really happy people. But I considered them just sort of facilitators. Uh, they loved their life. They loved getting my brother and me to Boy Scouts or to school or to church, uh, swimming lessons, watching uh, I Love Lucy on TV. And I never really thought of them as having a life before I came into the picture. And uh, they were very much in love, and they talked about their past and their dreams that they had uh, for each other uh, and uh, the dreams they wanted to share together. Yeah, and the, you got to see the manifestation of all those dreams and desires come come to life. Have you always wanted to write? I have. Uh, uh -huh. Even when I was a little kid, I was always writing stories and uh, having a lot of fun with it. I had hoped to incorporate it into a professional career early in my life. Um, I found that with all the life's distractions and all of the uh, job obligations, whatever, uh, it was very hard to do. And uh, even though I wrote from time to time and I thought, this is the year I'm going to sit down and write this novel, or this is the year I'm going to sit down and write this screenplay, uh, it's, it's, even if you get it written, the publishing of it or the marketing of it is a whole different story. Uh, 
and uh, just never quite was able to accomplish that with all of the other uh, life distractions and life involvements. So uh, uh, a very famous writer who I literally ran into one time in Washington, D.C. in a snowstorm and a hotel bar uh, told me that all a uh, writer needs to be successful is solitude and time. And, um, you know, I just didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, 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 I retired to pursue a writing career. Sure. Well, the pandemic of 2020 certainly gave you time and solitude because, you know, our lives changed. One of the unique letters, or several, several unique letters and correspondences in your book were between family members during the pandemic of 1918. You got to you got a glimpse, and the readers will get a glimpse into what life was like then, and how communities came together to help each other. But you had an unexpected thing happen at the beginning of the pandemic. Share that with us. <laughs> yeah, very <laughs> unexpected. Uh, you know, you make plans for your own <laughs> life, and sometimes God has a different plan. Detours. Yeah. But uh, I had. Um, retired from a very long, extremely happy career, um, uh, and, and a little bit earlier than most people retire, to finally pursue this um, long-time aspiration of writing. And um, I um, was sort of moving along with that. Uh, the, uh, the pandemic hit in March, just a couple of months after I retired. The same day I got a call from my um, allergist saying, your very your immune system can be compromised by the allergy medicine you're on. I live in Austin, Texas, where uh, there are a lot of uh, allergies like cedar fever and things like that. And he said, "Make sure uh, you take this quarantine seriously." So, the first day of the quarantine was also the first day I discovered uh, what was and was pretty much immediately diagnosed as uh, uh, an advanced melanoma, stage 3 metastasized melanoma. And um, so I was quarantined uh, with uh, recovering from cancer surgery and in cancer treatment all at the same time. You know, the theme of the show is overcoming odds and, and uh, overcoming our struggles. And I would say it's an, an incredible struggle that you must have had writing a book while undergoing chemotherapy? I I would think people would seem that way, and I would certainly had I thought about it or had planned something like that, uh, I thought, no way. But I think it was just sort of what God wanted me to do because in the midst of this, in the midst of the worst part of the cancer treatment where I was in a lot of pain and I was completely isolated and uh, for those of you in the Austin, Texas area, you know we had a very um, um, unusual winter with um, a phenomenal snowstorm and ice storm. So I was even double isolated like that. I couldn't get to the hospital if I tried. And so I just had to sort of grind it out. But um, in the middle of all of that, I had a publisher call. Now, the Shoebox Chronicles was originally a blog. And uh, I was just writing just different vignettes of different letters that I had um, come across and was able to build a story around uh, for uh, the um, blog um, supporters. The the book is only about uh, only about a third of the original uh, blog is in the book. Uh, uh, it's all pretty much new stuff, but uh, just a hint for someone who uh, might be looking at getting something published in, um, in this day and time. Uh, I hit on a pretty interesting secret. I think God hit on it because I wouldn't have planned it myself. But uh, my blog ended up being very successful. Not necessarily the blog that I was writing and publishing, but it was being picked up by a couple of church groups, a couple of veterans of foreign war groups, uh, and, and others and, um, who had mass distribution. So um, this publisher called and said, you know, a lot of people are uh, reading your blog. And uh, I was wondering if you'd ever thought about putting this into a book. So because they're seeing this, and I think this guy's already got a built-in audience and the starting point. And uh, so all of that happened in the middle of cancer 
and COVID. Wow. And so that's when I started putting this together, and I was so grateful. I, I don't think it's a cancer. And it's hard to say this because I met a lot of people during my cancer struggles. I'm very happy to be cancer-free right now, and I intend to stay that way. But um, for me, it was a blessing. And I don't want to say that and be disrespectful to so many people I met who are going through hell and back with them, with their own pain and their families. But uh, uh, But I was alone, and I was quiet, and I did some things like write this book that I would never have been able to do. And I had a publisher. So uh, the Shoebox Chronicles was not the original first book uh, I was going to write when I retired. I had a series of different things I wanted to wanted to write, from screenplays to short stories to um, essays um, to fiction and nonfiction. Uh, Shoebox Chronicles actually wasn't even on that list, but... Uh, uh, that was the one that the uh, the publisher called on, and so I figured that's what God wanted me to do, and it did fall into place. It's funny how things align like that. There is nothing random in this world. I agree. And God does direct the steps. You know, and the faith is a, is a is a theme in your life. It's also a theme in the book. But I would just say, after reading the book, I, an atheist could read this book and get something very much from so. it. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. So I have uh, friends from. Uh, a good friend of mine who's a Muslim uh, called me the other day and uh, she had heard about the book and got it off Amazon.com and she said, this book is absolutely beautiful. I uh, and, and of course, my Jewish friends and I do have uh, Jewish relatives uh, that are mentioned in the book and uh, so um, all of that. Uh, uh, it is the, when we were trying to, when we were talking about ways to get the book published, how are we going to market? And uh, it was important not to market necessarily as a Christian book uh, or even a faith-based book, but I think it was, to me, a values book. Uh, because ultimately, families work things out. You know, when, uh, and that's what happened in a lot of these letters over the years. Uh, when there was conflict or whatever, uh, you know, ultimately a family has to come back together. And uh, so, and it was based on values. Yeah. Uh, you know, they people love their children or their grandchildren, and they love their family, and so uh, that's what I was trying to celebrate with this book. Values are all through this book. I, I, I will concur. You know, one of the many tragedies from world history was Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass. And you mentioned you had Jewish relatives, and you write about them, and, the, and, and then highlight the correspondence between family members from Germany to, to um, Switzerland to the United States. Please share with our audience the story of Davida and her family and how they escaped Hitler's tyranny. Well, Davida was a child, and uh, her mother was Miriam, and her father was Hedrick, who was my, I guess, third cousin uh, living in Germany. And uh, back up one second. For people that, that may not remember this, describe Kristallnacht. I'm going to, yeah. Okay. The, um, <laughs> and, and, and I will say all of these stories are based on letters. You know, I did If there wasn't a letter attached to it, I did not put it in the Shoebox Chronicles. But my cousin Hedrick and his wife Miriam and their uh, four-year-old daughter Davida were living in Berlin. They were from Heidelberg. They were living in Berlin. He had served in World War One, uh, uh, fighting for Germany, fighting with the Kaiser. Uh, he was involved in the German Lutheran Church. Uh, they were both professors uh, in a small college in Berlin. Uh, his wife, Miriam, was Jewish. Mm -hmm. And they lived a very sort of academic life until um, what ultimately was became known as Crystal Night. And he wrote a letter to his mother, which is my Aunt Gertrude, living in Heidelberg, about what happened on November 10th. Uh, 1938, and Crystal Knot is also called the Night of Broken Glass, and it is a major footnote in history almost when you consider what happened after that. 
but it was the first public display of what Hitler referred to as the final solution, which was to rid the world of undesirables, especially the Jewish population. Mm -hmm. And Hedrick wrote this letter um, how the, you know, when you look back on it, um, the, there were Jewish police officers, but all of a sudden they disappeared. They got shipped away to concentration camps before the war ever started. But um, they just turned youth gangs to ravage any Jewish business or home they could find um, mm -hmm. in Berlin and then across Germany. And so they would go in and dump crystal out on the street. That's why they called it Crystal Night or the Night of the Broken Glass. And uh, this letter, which Hedrick wrote, which is actually kind of famous, it's in a Holocaust museum um, in Bonn, Germany, mm -hmm. uh, was <coughs> written. And I think the real significance of it, it was uh, written November 10th. I'm sorry, November 13th, uh, 1938. So it was just a couple of days after uh, Kristallnacht, and he was telling his mother what had happened. And um, he, it was a very personal letter. He had a very good friend who was uh, owned a Jewish bakery, and their other friend was the beat policeman. He, he worked the beat of their neighborhood and lived in the neighborhood. And uh, when this guy's bakery was being ravaged uh, by these Hitler youth gangs, he ran to this police officer. He was his friend, and um, he saw the police officer in the house, and he wouldn't open the door. Mm. And that was <coughs> Hedrick's sign that um, things were really getting bad. So he and his family, um, very soon after Christmas, moved down to Heidelberg, uh, where they were from, which is on the Swiss border, uh, hoping to find a little bit safer times. But of course, World War II broke out, and um, he, um, his wife, who was Jewish, um, and daughter ended up hiding in Switzerland. Wow. And Amazing story. I it, just couldn't believe that was unfolding in these letters. It is, and, and I don't want to reveal for anybody that has not, has not read the book, but you follow Davida into Palestine. And then, um, but there's a, so much correspondence back and forth. One thing I do want to bring up is they were so desperate when they were in Switzerland Miriam and Davida were living on a pig farm. And to the people in the Jewish religion, pigs are unclean animals. That's mm -hmm. how desperate that they were. Mm -hmm. And they were getting money sent to them uh, surreptitiously. Well, that's how I found out about all of this. Uh, because it was always just sort of slightly mentioned in our family. And, you know, we had a large family with a lot of history. And people were going on about their sins. Oh, yeah, we had uh, some, some Jewish family members um, hiding the Holocaust. Well, Hedrick's mother wrote a letter. It turned out they were living on a farm um, in Switzerland, near Lucerne, Switzerland, uh, of a very long-time family friend. And he was hiding them, but it was just a terrible time in Switzerland or anywhere, and Nazi sympathizers were blackmailing him to turn over um, Davida and Miriam uh, to the Nazis uh, to be shipped to concentration camps. So um, my Aunt Gertrude wrote all of the family members in the United States. They smuggled the letter out, which was quite risky at the time. Mm -hmm. And then I've seen these letters just went through our entire family. You know, send money to this farmer. And unfortunately, through a misguided aunt's, uh, um, what she thought were good intentions, those letters were destroyed. But um, I did have a family member who did an exchange program uh, when she was in college in Germany, and she touched base with the remnants of our family, and they led her to this 85-year-old uh, um, uh, farmer in Switzerland. So she went to visit him, and he was the farmer who hid David and Miriam, and he had the envelopes of a lot of my family's uh, letters that they sent to send him money because he was a stamp collector. Oh wow! So I had these great these people that were dead by this time, but I knew knew them by name, and he had all their envelopes and stuff. So that's how I knew, even though the letters were destroyed, I knew that my family was able to uh, provide assistance to help um, Davida and um, Miriam hide uh, all the way through the Holocaust. Wow, so the, that's a brave brave man hiding them out. And oh yeah, it was. Um, 
and, and the fact that that's part of my family history. But I didn't know that. Till, and, and I have to say, and I think every family has a story. Every family has a great story when you really dig down into it. I mean, just think of what type of stories are just coming out of this year alone if we write them down uh, with this historic presidential election, uh, with the Black Lives Matter, with the pandemic, uh, and now um, the pulling out of Afghanistan. These are all historical events that will probably be reduced to maybe a paragraph in history books 10 or 15 years down the road. Uh, but it's our history and how we dealt with it and how we live through it and our thoughts on this are so, so, so important. And every family has those stories, uh, but they've got to be written down. They are important, and I agree. In today's digital age, though, we email or we text. Or maybe even call. Right. And so unless people save those, print them and save them, they're gone forever. And it, com it's, it is a completely different time that we're talking about. Let's move into World War II. The U.S. is fully involved in, in, the, in the, the war against Japan and against uh, uh, Germany. You had a second cousin, Norvin Davis, yeah. who lost his life fighting Hitler's tyranny in World War II. How did that impact your family? I was a West Point graduate. Uh, my family never forgot about it, and they haven't forgotten about it today, uh, even though his parents um, have died and his siblings have died. Um, his, his sister died uh, last year at the age, and she was a big help for me to write that story. Mm -hmm. But there's not a family member in my family that does not have a picture of Norbert Davis on their wall of when he was at West Point, when he graduated from West Point. And um, they're passed down to the generations. Whoever has that picture will pass it down to the mm -hmm. oldest member of their family. Uh, because that was a huge sacrifice, and it dramatically affected our family. Um, and it certainly affected um, Norvin's mother and father for the rest of their lives. And they, um, in one of his letters, and uh, again, real quickly, you mentioned people don't write anymore. And during World War II, he was writing to his, his uh, specifically one of his really good buddies who was fighting in Europe, uh, who was his roommate in West Point. They were writing back and forth. He was writing to his family. So we heard about his dreams. Those letters were saved. We heard about his dreams, his desires. And he did say, I do not mind dying for my country. Uh, but I do, I am very sad for the people that I leave behind because I know they're going to be very hurt by this. And to the day his mother passed away, she passed away at the age of 94, I believe, in, I think, 1987, um, people that he served with, uh, people that he was in his, his West Point class, the people he served with, and then their children were still contacting her. They would uh, drive up to her house uh, maybe 200 miles away just to cut her grass, or they would write constant letters and just thinking about you. So uh, they try to make that up, and I think that that is the strength of our nation. And a terrible time for my family, but one that um, we will never forget. And I do worry, you know, just recently we had a tragedy in this country where 13 very brave men and women were killed in Afghanistan. Um, and that was a story for about a minute on the news, and then it became very political. Um, uh, not their deaths, but the politics of their deaths. Mm -hmm. And I just think we cannot forget the men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice uh, and died for this country. And in our family, it was Norbert Davis, and we will never forget him. We've set up a chain of – sort of a chain of command of our family <laughs> uh, to uh, – uh, to pass those those photos, that photo of him down to, to make sure we don't forget him. I think that's wonderful. You know, one thing that Representative Dan Crenshaw has said, you know, he's a former Navy SEAL, lost his eye, mm -hmm. and um, getting blown up. But he said, you know, when you see a service person, see a service man or woman, don't say thank you for your service. Say never forget. And it just that's what, a good point. That's what you just described just completely encompasses that and the entire meaning of what that means. I get chills talking about it. Never forget. And we can't forget. And it's such an honor to the memory of your 
second cousin, that the people he served with and even their children would come and stay in touch with his mother to give her some some comfort, if you will. Yeah. And it's a connection there, that the human connection and the goodness of people that we don't often see. You turn on Facebook or Instagram and all you see is, hey, look at me, or let me tell you how, how wrong you are about this or that. We don't see the goodness as often as we should. And stories like this just need to continue to be shared. They do. And you mentioned this a minute ago, and I, I want to go back and touch on it real quickly. Uh, when I was going through that shoebox, I decided I, I, I found the shoebox. Um, the house was completely empty in my parents' house. And the first thing I did was sort of put these, these letters in date order. And like I say, the first one was 1889. But I thought it was really interesting. This was 2017, but the last letter written was um, 1998. Hmm. And I thought, okay, what has happened? A lot had happened in that world, including 9-11 and all kinds of other things, but there were no letters uh, for a family that wrote lots of letters. But that's when social media started. That's when email. we started doing emails. We started doing um, Instagram. You know, that, that's just evolved and, and evolved. And then even cards, even birthday cards, Christmas cards. You don't write letters on those things anymore. They're slick, glossy pictures, and um, uh, if people get them wrong, I mean, they just get them and, and um, look at them and basically throw them away. And the written word, and these stories must be written down. And that's the heart of the Shoebox Chronicles, is that mm-hmm. all of these, every family has these stories. There's not, and 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 I'm I'm so honored with the people who called me first who read the blog, uh, but then who um, now are reading the book, and uh, they're saying, my family has the same stories, mm. but they've got to be written down, and they got to be, and, and, and that's almost a lot. We can't let that be a lost art, uh, because that is the only thing that connects us uh, to our past, uh, so that we can plot a, a future for each family. I mean, we're, families are core. But if you lose that history, you have lost everything. That is very true. That is very true. Now, we're going to move into, <clears throat> let's just say, two of the most colorful characters I've ever oh, read about. Oh, no, I know you can talk about and, this. And I can't mention these people without laughing. I mean, it, 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 anyway, so you have an aunt and an uncle, Aunt Fred and Uncle Fern. <laughs> that's, their, that's their real names, okay? Aunt Fred and Uncle Fern. You devoted several chapters to them, but... Please, for our audience, please describe Aunt Fred and Uncle Fern. <laughs> oh, I think they're kind of undescribable. Uh, but, uh, you know, just their <laughs> names, Fred and Fern, and uh, what's made <clears throat> worse, uh, they're, they had twins, uh, their daughter Frankie and their son Frank, and um, they had uh, children. <laughs> all um, I think Frankie's daughter was um, uh, Frances and uh, Fawn, and Frank had a son who he named Fred after his mother, uh, which was named Fred, which is short for Frederica. So always the truth is so much more interesting than (laughs) fiction. I mean, you can't make that stuff up. But Uncle Fred was somebody I was scared to death of um, when I knew him in my life. Uncle Fern. Fern. I'm sorry, Uncle Fern. See, I'm I'm messing up myself. (laughs) Uncle Fern was a, um, uh, I remember I asked him, I said, so, now, Fred was short for Frederica, but I asked him one time, I, I had enough nerve to ask him uh, something. I said, so w- what is Fern short for? And he looked at me and he said, Fern. So I never <laughs> said another word to him. <laughs> but um, he was a fire and brimstone minister in numerous congregations in, uh, through Central and South Texas, mostly small towns. And whenever my family was traveling to visit relatives anywhere near him, we had to go to church in his um, wherever he was preaching, and I was always scared to death of his. Uh, he would preach with a voice that you could hear in the next county, and he was always finding Satan's infiltration <laughs> into the lives of his congregation, and he did not mind calling them out. Um, he called out the high school football star one time, and I thought he was talking to me. The guy happened to be sitting in front of me. And, um, you know, my parents before those church services, 
I mean, I'd never been so scrubbed, and my hair was in place, and my clip-on tie was uh, uh, was was in the right place. But uh, anyway, the high school football star showed up for church wearing white socks, and somehow that was totally unacceptable to Uncle Fred. Satan's influence on him. I guess. Oh yeah, <laughs> but um, the there is a letter in the shoebox chronicles which shows that um, Uncle Fred was had a little bit of a progressive side to him, which I didn't see when I knew him. But um, when um, uh, his uh, granddaughter sent me a letter, knowing I was collecting family letters, uh, like I say, a lot of letters from the shoebox were sent to me uh, after I started doing the blog, and people wanted to share their different family letters. But uh, uh, his daughter had written him about um, his her daughter's school um, – I think ninth grade in um, small Texas town near Waco. Uh, they were starting to teach evolution, and uh, she was really upset about it. Wanted guidance from Uncle Fern about what to do when she went to the school board uh, to make sure that her daughter was um, excluded from that class. And he wrote a very tender letter uh, to his granddaughter, saying, "I think you should go to that class. I think that uh, he said the more I study science, which I've always loved, the more I'm." realize that science and religion go hand in hand and um, I think you should go and learn from it and it will strengthen your already strong faith uh, in, in God and so that was Uncle Fern then there's Aunt before, Fred. before we go to before we go into to, to Aunt Fred oh God, what a um, piece of work <laughs> They're probably staring down at heaven, ma- making sure you're getting their names right. Otherwise, <laughs> you're, hard. Just, you're destined for hell, too. But, you know, you articulated the arc of, the, of both of their lives very, very well in the, in the book. And I, I've got to tell you that the fact that he encouraged their granddaughter to go and study the science of evolution says, you know, it's, to me it says, don't be afraid to challenge your convictions. Because mm-hmm. you either see things differently or your convictions get stronger. But it is not a threat. Nowadays, it seems like people want to want to fight over something and they get convicted. They will die on that hill no matter what that hill is just because they want to be morally mm-hmm. right or self-righteously right. And I thought that was a beautiful – in fact, I – I did too. I, I, know what you're, I, I know what you're saying. I, I thought that uh, – I wrote the quote down, and I want to read it for the audience oh, sure. because it's so beautiful as well as so articulate. Quote, I have studied scientific facts about our universe for years, and I have always concluded the more science I study, the more in awe I am of the amazing creativity of our heavenly creator. End of quote. That's pretty awesome. That really is. And then that, um, like I say, my uh, view of him up until that point was shaking in a, <laughs> uh, on a church pew just praying that I had not uh, – Engage in some type of uh, <laughs> transgression that was going to be called out, but uh, but I, I really like that, and I like that about him. I like that he was a very progressive thinker and encouraged his granddaughter to be a progressive thinker. And then there's Aunt Fred. <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> I can't mention her without laughing about her because her her story is so well written about her and her peculiarities. Let's just call them. Tell us, describe Aunt Fred for our audience. Well, they are the most uh, she and. Um, uh, Uncle Fern are are featured prominently throughout the book, uh, but when I sat down with my publisher to publish the book, I didn't want this to be just like the blog, a bunch of individual stories about a letter or about a family member. I wanted to tie it into a a story about my family, so that people would get an idea of what my whole, my family was about, and what our history was about. So, uh, because Aunt Fred was a ferocious writer. Her letters appeared in pretty much every family <laughs> crisis or discussion uh, from our first racial marriage to uh, draft dodgers to, um, oh gosh, you name it. Um, they were um, uh, somebody wearing a low-cut dress to her own mother's funeral. And, they and these said, are all in the book. Yeah, they are in the book. So they provide humor, but they, find, they provide the guidepost for the whole story. But you wanted to know about Aunt. Fred. Um, I don't know if your viewing audience is uh, familiar with uh, the church lady on Saturday Night Live, but that was her. I mean, and she 
was on a constant <coughs> crusade against Satan, which she found at every turn. And she got the Reader's Digest banned from the library. <laughs> for using the, well, it was banned from, uh, yeah, the church was taking, uh, people would make donations to the church to take magazines and books and things to, to nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And some people brought Reader's Digest to them, and um, and she just went nuts and and took them out of the stacks and made it very clear that no one should ever bring the Reader's Digest uh, into their church because they actually used the word, I guess I can say it on your, yeah. on your uh, vagina. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, but uh, she that was- That kind of gives a picture of how uptight she was. Right, was, so she was always getting books banned from the library and things, but she- I'm sure National, Gra National Geographic had right, no oh, that chance. Was, that didn't have a chance <laughs> because of um, the, uh, the, the photographs of um, Native Af Africans in their Native costume. And uh, she um, she had this big giant, as many most rural homes in the time had, these big giant 50-gallon barrels uh, where they burned trash mm -hmm. in the back of their house. And um, so um, her trash barrel saw Elvis Records, saw uh, Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking. Norman Vincent Peale was a pastor. <laughs> well, she didn't <laughs> like him because... Um, she felt like he was more interested in himself than Jesus Christ. Okay. That was her words, not mine. But uh, so she got that book banned from the library. Uh, she the got Fountainhead. A she got a nickname because of that burn barrel. Oh, gosh. I, I, that is a – and I will tell that story. She's the porn purveyor of Pleasanton, Texas. Yes, they how's, were – How'd she get the name? They were the um, – uh, well, um, Uncle Fern was the minister uh, of his church in um, – in Pleasanton, Texas, and um, one day, Aunt Fred found under her son's bed this gigantic cache of Playboy magazines. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so, armed with a stack of uh, those magazines and a can of kerosene, she went out to the band barrel and she was ripping out these page by page um, pictures of topless women and, and crude jokes and throwing them in the barrel. and um, then she, But uh, evidently, Frank had a large um, cache of magazines, but she had to make several trips back to the house. <laughs> and um, one trip, she forgot to put the wire covering over the barrel that would keep these papers from flying out. So she came back, and um, a lot of very partially burned pages uh, had... <coughs> were elevated out of the um, garbage can because she forgot to put the cover on and um, that's drifted over the <laughs> high school baseball field just as the team was taking the field for practice and they got a great joy out of these pictures uh, but uh, so she was dubbed the uh, porn purveyor of Pleasanton, Texas for a while and it was soon died down I'm not sure if, if somebody else had done it they, she would have been as forgiving but that's just one of <laughs> that's just one of many stories of Aunt Fred, who um, who was featured all the way through the uh, the Shoebox Chronicles because she was a very interesting character, and um, I think people just could not throw her letters away, so uh, they lived to haunt her. <laughs> and let's uh, let's close with Aunt Fred. I think I think we'll close on a high note and to to learn more of the adventures of Aunt Fred, and there are many in here that are even funnier than that one. You, you have got to read this book, The Shoebox Chronicles. Um, I, wanted, I want to make sure everyone knows that Mark is not taking any royalties from the sale of this book. All net proceeds are going to charity. So it truly is a work from the heart. Now, how do people find you, Mark? Um, yes, the easiest way is on my website, www.markmarklehman-writer. And when you go to that, you can find my... Facebook page, my email, my cell phone number, and my home address. Uh, also, um, minor plug, uh, uh, you can find how to um, purchase the book. There are numerous ways. Uh, my publisher um, uh, publishes themselves at Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble. It's in most local bookstores, but uh, all of those will be uh, on the website and, uh, and also how to contact me. There's also a way that someone can get a personalized copy that you will personalize to them, an autograph. 
Uh, yeah, that's and that will be on there, and uh, that's a lot of fun because if you look at the front of the um, the the book, you can hold that up again. Uh, by the way, that is the original shoebox that I found. Is it really? Yeah, wow. uh, and uh, so I've um, uh, with some help of some artistic friends, of which I am not. Uh, uh, the um, they've wrapped those in sort of vintage paper with vintage stamps, and uh, uh, and I signed the book and sent it out for people who want to give that out as a gift. And yeah. so they arrive wrapped, and um, it, it makes it kind of interesting. So that's also on the web page. Very cool. Very cool. MarkLayman-Writer.com, and I will have it in the um, notes with my uh, info to the what to the uh, Determined People podcast when we publish it. And that's our show for today. You know, and I want to encourage everyone to take to heart what he said. We, if we only use digital communications, th we lose a lot of our family history. And one of the things that, that is in our identity as people is our name and our history. Where are we from? Where did we come from? Not just where we're going, but where did we come from? What are our roots? Who are our, who are our relatives? So I encourage you, take time to start chronicling things. To if you, if you use email, that's fine. Print them. Put them in a book. Keep them for your family, for future generations, so they will know your version of what history that we're going through now. Uh, people who lost loved ones in, in foreign wars, Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever, they may have emails going back and forth print them because that's part of your history. You know, they didn't have that luxury back in, until about 1998 or 1999, but we, but, but we have the ability to do it and preserve our history. I would ask that uh, everyone who likes the podcast, the, the Determined People podcast, go on iTunes and drop us a review. It, it helps us get noticed and helps us spread the encouragement, strength, and hope to a world that's in desperate need of those things. If you don't like the podcast, don't worry about the review. We're fine. I'll be back tomorrow with another one-minute inspirational message. Until then, be well.